Good morning once again. Welcome to The Breakfast for those who are just joining us here on PLOS TV Africa. Our final conversation this morning is going to be on the judicial panel set up to investigate cases of police brutality and of course the end SARS uh, protest, uh, the Lekki Togate shooting. Uh, we have continued to follow up on the judicial panel inquiry and we also reported when the uh, panel of course uh, gave uh, leverage to the LCC to go back to the toll gates. Mm -hmm. Uh, this morning, we're going to be uh, speaking on how far and how well has the judicial panel uh, uh, fared. Uh, Fishayo uh, Shoyombo, Fisayo, I beg your pardon, <laughs> Fisayo Shoyombo, Shoyombo. Uh, yes. this morning is uh, very, very uh, well respected and um, um, investigative journalist here in Nigeria. I remember one of the big things that he was known for was when he spent some time in prison in, uh, you know, doing his own investigative report. Um, and I've thought about that over and over, if I really will be able to put myself through that. Good morning, Fisayo. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thanks, Thanks. for having me. Thanks it's for great being to have here. You on the program. Um, I want to start with, you know, asking uh, for, you know, over time, since October 2020, when eventually the judicial panel of inquiry was set up across the country, many people had zero faith in it. There's also been very, you know, you know, signs here and there and the incidents that have occurred, like, you know, the army pulling out uh, here and there. And of course, other things that have occurred that have made people to also have less and less trust in the process. What would you say is some bits of success that we've recorded from the judicial panel of inquiry? Are there things that we should celebrate as um, victories from that panel? Absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll say the things we have to celebrate are exactly the reasons no one should have had faith in the panel in the first place. This panel was not set up after the Lekki Tollgate incident. A lot of people do not know. People mix it up. Yes, the panel listens to matters concerning the Tollgate incident, but that's not why the governor of the state set it up. He set it up around October 15, 16. Four days before protesters were killed at the Toll Plaza. So, if you're asking if the panel has, if there are things to celebrate in the remit of the panel from start, absolutely yes. You have people who have been um, who have been harassed, detained, maimed, injured, killed by SARS. The panel has listened to their cases and has awarded damages: five million, seven million, four million, three million. So. In that way, we can say we have made progress, you know, because people who never thought they could get justice, people who thought their cases had been closed forever, got reprieved from the panel. So, yes, as far as incidents that predate the NSAS protest, as far as those incidents are concerned, the panel has done well. When it comes to what happened at Lekki, you can't say the panel has done well. This is a panel that said if the army refuses to come, there's nothing it can do. You know, okay. the, 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 the protagonists of what happened on October 20 pulled out of the panel and it admitted that there was nothing they could do. That's so, the matter. So, Fisayo, let's talk about, uh, you know, the legality of this panel, first of all, you know, and just how much judicial powers they weigh to preside over matters and invite key witnesses in the story. Remember when the army pulled out, they pulled out so many times, you know, they call them to the panel and they fail to show up, they fail to send representatives as well. And lawyers on this platform, you know, we debated this matter to see just how much legal power does the judiciary have, the judicial panel of inquiry have? Do you think the government needs to give them more, more, more power? I don't think the challenge the panel faces is that of judicial powers. You see, it's a challenge of body language. When the president came in, they said, oh, body language, power supply had increased, body language, corruption had reduced, body language. It's the same body language that has come into play. Look, the army did not just go to the panel without receiving orders from somewhere. So who ordered the army? These are people with political powers. And these are the people that set up the panel. The army understands that it can pull out of the panel and nothing is going to happen. The evidence won't fall. As long as that understanding is there, as long as the people, you know, who have the powers to set up that panel are still the class that, you know, the perpetrators, the, the others came from. 
Does this not mm -hmm. then lead us to the point where we started? Because if the you know people involved, like the army, feel you know they they do not you know they cannot or they can choose to not show up at that panel then what really is the essence of setting up the panel to probe the activities of you know people involved like the army exactly the panel should close the lucky matter and focus on what it has done well at so far and that's pre insert protest matters let's know that what happened at lucky no one is interested in covering in in unveiling needs in compensating victims look the government knows these victims let's let's stop deceiving ourselves the government knows these victims a lot of the injured guys were operated on at hospitals that the government is aware of so if the government wants to compensate victims of what happened on october 20 2020 if the government knows where to find them the panel has met some of them so it's look like um the, the lady who pulled out, Reno said, it looks like this is something about some performative action. Let's show that we are working. All right. But the work doesn't even need to happen, you know, within the confines of the panel. The panel, the, the, the army has shown that it is above the law in this country. And as long as that continues, there's nothing the panel can do. All right. Let, let's also then speak about the aftermath of, you know, the panel and the whole, you know, protest. Uh, there were moments when uh, uh, travel bans were, uh, you know, in pro you know, in action against certain people. There were people who had their bank accounts frozen. Uh, there is, of course, uh, rumors that certain places were places were demolished, you know, because um, or those are conspiracy theories because of the role that they played with the protests. But also, I've also seen on your Twitter feed that there is people who are still in jail that were arrested during the protest and after the protest. Um, what do all these things really say? And, and, you know, how far have we come or have, you know, the, have you come rather with those people who have, you know, continued to be in, in police custody since the protest? Is there any hope that they would be released? Yes, there is hope they will be released once their case filters into the media, once their case gets into, pop, into the limelight. There's hope. What usually happens is that nobody gets to know. I didn't know until a lady cried out on Twitter, um, penultimate weekend. I didn't know, you know, and I thought it was, like you said, a rumor until I started digging, started digging, talked to one of the two lawyers, you know, involved in the case, talked to uh, the sister of one of the, the, the detainees. It turned out to be true. Who, who would, I, even I didn't expect that people involved in NSA protests of October are still in detention. And that tells you, that summarizes the interest of the government. The government is not generally interested in this NSAS protest itself. You know, it's only interested in showing that, look, it, it doesn't want you to, uh, to come out again. The government, look, the government, no one expected what happened in October. Even I didn't expect it. People in political circles, in government places, in public office, they were shocked to the marrow. And they don't want that to happen again. So they're trying to show that, oh, you are interested. But genuinely, you can't be interested. You know, you can't truly believe that police brutality is a problem that needs to be solved. And then you still go after people who protested. You, you send security agents to break into people's homes. There's a guy in Abu Dhabi's case is still on. You know, the DSS broke into his home in the dead of the night because he participated in the protest for two days, just two days. So when you have incidents like that, um, um, you, you, you freeze people's accounts and then, you know, the court counters you, counters you, sorry, showing that these actions were needless in the first place. The government has to be sincere, you know, in its actions because the people... The people are not blind, you know. There are people who can read in between the lines and can see out the real intention of the government. And it is clear the government is still pained by that protest and is out to punish those who were deeply involved in it. All right. You, okay. you also, um, apologies, uh, Natalia. You also, you know, have done something called portraits of blood. Um, I, I want us to speak quickly about that and uh, what were some of the biggest revelations that you, um, you know, you you know, encountered uh, while putting that together. Um, what are the things that you learned? What are the things that are still unknown with regards to the NSARS protest uh, since, you know, uh, Portraits of Blood was released? Number one is that there are agents of government. I'm very careful in the choice of my words. There are agents of government that are interested in silencing 
the proponents of that protest. You know, I listened to an audio. A lady was called, and the guy was threatening and was saying, "The punishment, the punishment for sin is death. Stop all this agitation about compensation for victims. Stop, because we know where you will we'll get you. You know, that can only be a government agent." Who is interested in the end to agitation for compensation of victims? It can only be, you know, agents, you know, people with government. And the guy said it during the conversation. We are the people benefiting from government today. You can't, you can't come and ruin things for us. So there are agents working for government who are making efforts, who made efforts in the past to silence the victims. Two, look at the shanty that was raised. That shanty has been there, you know, for ages. These guys didn't get adequate notice. Just came all of a sudden and they burnt the place down. These were the guys who, by virtue of their location, of you know, their residence, saw the things that happened on that night. And these are the guys who spoke to the media. One of those guys spoke to me. And three weeks later, I went back. The guy said, the first day, he sought me out. He was the one who wanted to talk to me. Three weeks later, I said, look, okay, I don't want to talk to you. Three of our guys here have been arrested. We haven't seen them since then. In fact, what I told you three weeks ago, I didn't say it. I don't have money, but I like that I still have my freedom. I can walk into my um, um, shanty and come out. Look, I don't want to talk again. These guys were intimidated. And then suddenly, they went there, they burnt the place down. What? These are, these are the guys who spoke to the media the most. And had concrete things to say because they lived there. They saw things. What was the hurry about burning that place down? That tells you something. You know, when you are not there, we, let's see how you will speak to journalists. So that's clear, you know. There are hospitals where people know that, yes, protesters were killed. If you read some of the things I, I, I tweeted about this protest, I never used the word massacre until I finished my investigation and concluded that, indeed, what happened on, 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 on October 20. It's a massacre. See, when people say, there are people who say there, there, there was nothing because they, they work for government, they're interested in government, they believe, I understand that. But there are people who genuinely, naively think that nothing happened. You know, you can't, when you say massacre, it doesn't have to be 300 people, it doesn't have to be 100 people. People use the word massacre in the sense of the way it sounds and expect it has to go. It's about whether the deaths were indiscriminate or not, you can have a massacre of 40 people. It's indiscriminate killing. When soldiers pick guns and they shoot ka -ka 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 -ka, in the direction, and then in the other direction. Ka -ka. Okay. Um, like that, that's a massacre. And that's what, that's what happened. Something else I discovered, most of the victims are people at the base of the social ladder, who are not on Twitter, who are not on Facebook. When people say, where are the, where are the families? Where are the friends? These are people who don't even have avenues to cry out. One of them went to the panel. What happened to it? Abuta Solomon. You know, there are people, but these are not people who have a voice, who, who know where to go to, who know who to run to. And some of them are being intimidated. They don't want to talk. I met someone who said, my, my, my nephew was killed, but his dad doesn't want to talk. He doesn't want government to come after him. So yes, clean job in terms of getting protesters off the street, using the gun, and then cleaning up the mess. Fantastic cleanup job, and that's why a lot of people doubt it. But it's also shown um, that quite a number of people still do not understand how their country works. It's not in the it's not government interest to get protesters off the streets through crude means, and then show you this is what we have done. It has to be cleaned up, and too many things point in that direction. Fisayo. One very powerful thing to note about the NSAS protest and what we've seen in our country in the past few months is social media. We saw like never before how Nigerians rallied together on social media, showed activism, advocacy, you know, for the rights of Nigerians on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, using the instrument of social media to drag international ten attention to what was happening in the country. Have you ever seen anything like this? Did we expect this kind of, you know, attention that the social media was able to generate, that Nigerian youth was able to generate? Also, I want to get your thoughts on the social media bill and all its supposed penalties for people who breach it. First, I wasn't surprised by what happened on social media, 
what surprised me was what happened in real life. I didn't think people would hear that soldiers were coming to the toll gate and they would stay. You know, in a number of states, I didn't expect people would, would go out. I didn't even expect that when some guy said occupy toll gate, I was looking at them and I was thinking, these guys are not going to come out, but they did. I was shocked by the sheer resilience of the young people who came out. I was not one bit surprised about the power of social. The social media is powerful. It's a tool for galvanizing support for any good thing that's done. Of course, it can also be a negative tool because there were indeed cases of fake news, you know. And a, a, a part of me even feels that the, the fake news of that era is sponsored because the violence, the violence that tainted the NSAS protest was sponsored. You know, the guys who are genuinely protesting were not violent. Some people went to import them. We saw the videos. You saw SUVs. In Abu Dhabi, for instance, SUVs drive to protest grounds and offload victims. Who gets SUV? I mean, how? That shows that people with huge financial power, potentially with huge political connections, political connections were interested in getting those guys. So I wouldn't be surprised if those guys also went to the extent of posting fake news. But in terms of how social media helped to draw international attention, New York Times, CNN, BBC, Reuters, I'm not one bit, one bit surprised. Right. Social media bill, it's not new. Those who watch Nigeria's political space understand that the government is desperate to more full dissenting voices. It has done it in a number of ways, you know, freezing of accounts of, uh, you freeze accounts before investigating. Oh, no, you, you don't do that. Make your findings first. You, have, you, you need to have it. So what was the motive for freezing the account? Suspicion. So if you have a government that acts that way, that uses the CBN, the central bank, in that manner, then how much more social media bill, you know, pre, pre, preserving right. uh, jail times to people who tweet what the government doesn't like? How about jail times for, for, for failed politicians? For right. failed um, also, performing that, you know, corrupt leaders? How about jail times for them? Those are the things you should be interested in, not people tweet. Remember, if the state, if the country works well, people will even have time to tweet things on social media if business is booming. You know, I have a farm. It has not been destroyed by a headsman. I have to wake up in the morning, go to the farm, come back in the evening. Do I have time for Twitter? No. Fisario, Fisario. The the not, not muffling voices on social media. Oh, um, it's, it's, this has not been one of my best interviews. It's, it's uh, too many sad revelations here from what you've said. Um, but I want to, you know, find my final question this morning would be, you know, about the reactions to the... Uh, LCC or from the, L, the uh, judicial panel, of course, to the LCC to go back to the toll gate. Uh, what's your reaction to that? Do you think it was justified? And of course, uh, those people who say that, you know, the, some members of the panel also betrayed the uh, whole idea of setting up the panel in the first place, what would you say to those people? First thing is that there was no sudden betrayal. We already knew where people stood. Some of the voters, by virtue of their comments in the pre-panel era, we already know where they stood. For instance, everyone knows where I stand. I mean, everyone who has listened to whatever I had to say before now had an idea where I stood about this protest because I spent time, you know, undercover in a police cell. I know the things that happen when the police have privacy to deal with victims, and that was my basis for supporting it. People who felt otherwise, they made their intentions known before. If one or two of them got to the panel, you don't expect them to act contrary to the beliefs they expressed previously. So the positions that people took, nothing surprised me. Um, the, the, the other part of your question, yes, the panel granting LCC the rights, did LCC clear itself of the allegations against it? I spoke with protesters who told me that when they were doing candle lights, they went to LCC officials, can you please turn off these lights? Just for two minutes, so that the candles that we have you know, lit can reflect very well. It looks like a proper candlelight procession. And they said, no, have you ever seen these lights go off? And then the lights went off on, October, on the, the, the night of October 20. What happened? LCC has still not explained it. You know, members of the panel said it at that time that LCC had not properly cooperated with the panel in terms of 
providing footages from that night in terms of the forensic investigations that went on. You know, if the LCC had not yet completely cooperated with the panel, what was the basis for the opening of the toll gate? Indeed. Because, like I said earlier, it was genuinely not about unveiling what happened at the panel. It was about showing a semblance of action to keep people quiet. And that's why it was not important for the panel to say LCC should resume. Big questions, really, for us to ask, and we continue to ask these questions till we get answers. Award-winning investigative journalist Fisaya Shoyombo, thank you very much for your time on The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa this morning. All All right. Right. I'm not sure you can hear us anymore. <laughs> Thanks anyway. Uh, well, if you missed out on any of it, as always, uh, go to our social media platforms at Plus TV Africa, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Also, remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel, also at Plus TV Africa. Thanks for joining us. I am Musao Gye Ogbawa. And I am Aneta Felix. Bye-bye.